Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long discussion between a guest host and the author of a new book. This week, Catherine Olmsted, professor of history at the University of California, Davis, talks about her book, Real Enemies, which looks at the role of conspiracy theories in American history and politics. Professor Olmsted discusses her book with University of Southern California sociology professor Barry Glasner, author of The Culture of Fear, Why Americans Are Afraid of the Wrong Things. This interview was taped on the campus of UCLA during the 2009 Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. I'm Barry Glasner. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Southern California and the author of several books, including The Culture of Fear and more recently The Gospel of Food. And it's my great pleasure today to be in conversation with Professor Catherine Olmsted. She's a professor of history at the University of California at Davis. She's a specialist in political and cultural history of the United States in the 20th century. She's also the author of three books, the first, Challenging the Secret Government, which is about the investigations of the CIA and the FBI following Watergate. The second book, titled Red Spy Queen, which is a biography of Elizabeth Bentley. And her third book, the book that we're going to be discussing today, Real Enemies, Conspiracy Theories and American Democracy, World War I to 9-11. So I'd like to begin with an incident uh, in your book that I found particularly revealing about uh, really the whole theme of the book and a lot of what's been going on in the U.S. And this goes back to 1992 when Bill Clinton had been elected president. Uh, and he called in his longtime friend, Webster Hubble. Uh, and you recount how he talked to his friend, who he was thinking of appointing, planning to appoint to a high position in the administration. Uh, and he gave him a couple of secret orders. So he asked him two questions that you recall in the book. First was, who killed JFK? And the second was, are there UFOs? Now, as I was reading this, I was thinking, wow, how did we get to that point in U.S. history that this young, very bright, very well-educated president um, would essentially take so seriously a couple of conspiracy theories? Well, that's why I included the incident in the book, is I think it's so revealing that by 1992, we had gotten to the point where the head of government had conspiracy theories about the government. You know, and so, so what I explore in the book exactly is how did we get to this point that uh, Bill Clinton himself would think that there was uh, perhaps some government involvement in a cover-up of UFOs or a cover-up in the Kennedy assassination and that there were secret government files somewhere that Webb Hubble you know, now could put his hands on um, and that all it took was access and then you could find out the answers to these questions. So conspiracy theories about the government were really permeating American culture by the 1990s. So by that point they were really quite common even, even to the point that a president um, would, would take them seriously. So let's go back, you're a historian, mm -hmm. um, let's, let's go way back. Um, and I also found intriguing that in, in your review of, of U.S. history in this regard that in the 18th and 19th century, while conspiracy theories about the government were not non-existent, they were pretty rare. Um, but then, you know, even um, even in the beginning of the 20th century, they were pretty uncommon, and then they just took off, right? And so, so what changed? Why, and, and, and I guess I'm interested in both parts. Why were they so uncommon in the early days? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that they were non-existent in the early days, but they tended to focus on individuals. So that, uh, well, first of all, there were a lot of conspiracy theories about uh, minority groups. So that uh, Americans, some Americans would have conspiracy theories about the Jews, or the Catholics, or the Masons, or the Mormons. And there was an emphasis on religious or racial minorities. There were conspiracies about the government, but they tended to be uh, fears that um, there would be a cabal of individuals who would um, have uh, undue influence on, in the colonial era, on the king, and then in the uh, national period, on the president. What begins to change in the 20th century, and especially after World War I, and that's why I start the book there, 
is uh, Americans start to have conspiracy theories, not just about individuals who might take over the government, but about the government itself. That it's not just a fear that there might be malign people in the government, but that the state itself is a sinister force. And the reason is that before World War I, the U.S. government was so small that, you know, it doesn't do that much. But beginning in World War I, you have the emergence of the modern state in the United States. And so you start having a government that's big enough to uh, carry out conspiracies, and that, in fact, does sometimes carry out conspiracies. It's also a government that starts having surveillance agencies, which is a, a first in American history. During World War I, uh, the government criminalizes dissent with the Espionage and Sedition Act. So it's against the law for Americans to criticize the government, and they start having secret agents go around and uh, arrest people who are making public speeches and also intimidate uh, Americans who are um, viewed as unpatriotic. So that, uh, for example, a Bureau of Investigation agent might go up to someone and say, um, I hear that you were criticizing the war effort. You know that's against the law. Do you want me to refer you to the prosecutor or do you promise not to do this anymore? So there's intimidation, there's also prosecution, there's surveillance. And so Americans start to, to believe that the government is surveilling them because it is and they start to worry more about government conspiracies from that moment on. But then, uh, there were, by the time that we get to the 20s, 1920s, 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, conspiracy theories have really kind of taken hold. I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly common and, and um, there's a fair amount of talk about them. And I was struck by the fact that in your book you show that really they had some major effects um, isolationism w was among them, right? Could you could you talk a little bit about the, the kind of the outcome of this? Yes. Well, the conspiracy theories about World War One were that either arms manufacturers and or bankers had tricked the United States into joining the war, and these conspiracy theories are particularly prevalent uh, in the mid 1930s, so about 15, 20 years after the war is over, and as a result, many Americans. Uh, believe that the United States should never have gotten involved in the last World War, that uh, they were deceived into it, that the United States had no um, real national interest in it, and so this conditions their response to the world crisis of the 1930s. So that they believe since the last war was a mistake, getting into the next World War will also be a mistake. So uh, the theories about World War I one really influenced the way Americans um, interpret the crisis, crises in Europe and Asia in the late 1930s. And then following from that, I think you said even in, in the book, even as recent, as, as late rather, as 1941, right? Britain is sort of standing alone against Hitler and what was it, 80 something percent of, of the country was still opposed to American participation in, in the war, is that right? Yes. And so how much of that um, sentiment would you say had to do with this kind of conspiratorial thinking and, and, and sense of, the, of the, the recent history? I think a lot of it did because um, people believed that the United States had gotten involved in the last war because uh, there were financial interests uh, that wanted to support Britain for their own financial gain. And so they believed that this the Second World War was a, a replay of the last and they did not um, make allowance for the fact that Hitler was not the Kaiser, you know? and they saw, um, they did not believe that the United States had any national interest in getting involved in World War II. So at that point then, how were these conspiracy theories spread among the population? You know, we think now, you know, you go online, they're all over the internet. Right. How, how did they spread at that, in that period? Well, of course, it's, it's much more difficult. Um, uh, in the, I start the book in the World War I period, and there's a, there's a famous free speech case from World War I in which uh, a group of anarchists who believed that President Wilson was involved in a conspiracy uh, both to get the United States into World War I but also to intervene in the, in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia decided that they wanted to print up their theories. And so they wrote them up and they, they printed them on a, on a um, hand-operated printing press and they got a bunch of leaflets and then they, they climbed to the 
top of the tallest building they could find in Midtown Manhattan, and then they threw the leaflets down. Literally. Yeah, just literally dropped them on the head.